All right, everybody. Welcome back. It's Mark here with Miramar College, and today we're going to be going over one of our potentially testable skills. It's long bone immobilization. We'll talk a little bit about musculoskeletal trauma, types of injuries, PMS checks. We'll talk about all that. But before we get started, I just want to say to you guys, if you are still with us, if you are still in the class taking the, taking the program here at Miramar during this COVID-19 situation, I just want to say thank you. Thanks for sticking in there. Uh, it's been a real journey putting this whole program online, and it's got a few growing pains here and there, but I just want to say thank you guys for sticking with it. Uh, we only have a, a few weeks left here, five, six weeks left before we're done. So stay strong. You see the light at the end of the tunnel. And hopefully we can get you guys back in and start skills testing sooner rather than later. But we'll all take it one day at a time. Right now, let's talk about musculoskeletal trauma, things we need to know, some general rules, emergency medical care, types of splints. We'll talk about it all. Now let's start with types of injuries. Uh, fracture is a break in the continuity of the bone. That's generally categorized as open or closed. Dress open fractures with sterile dressings only. There are many types of fractures. Complications can include hemorrhage from the bone itself, vessel, nerve damage, potential infection, and tissue damage. So uh, obviously fractures are something that we need x-rays to confirm. So in the field, we always call them suspected fractures, but really pay attention to where it says dress open fractures with sterile dressings only. We talked about dressings versus bandages in our last video on bleeding control. And it's really, really important that you guys keep the integrity of those open wounds intact. So you, you only allow sterile surfaces to contact those. Now a strain, a strain is an injury to a muscle and or tendon possibly by overextension. This may tear muscle fibers and cause pain, and it's generally characterized with little to no discoloration or swelling with pain on palpation to the specific site, okay? Now, that differs from a sprain, where a sprain is an injury to a joint capsule with tearing or damage to the connective tissue, usually involving ligaments. That joint will become inflamed and swollen with discoloration following after several hours. Now, a dislocation is a displacement of bone from its normal position in a joint. The joint is found in an abnormal position with an obvious deformity and usually swelling. The patient is typically unable to move the extremity. So for all these types of injuries, uh, you can use a splint in one fashion or another. And we have a few examples here. Here's a SAM splint, which is a sheet of aluminum with some non-porous foam surrounding it. Here's a vacuum type splint. These actually have a little bit of air in them and some spherical little uh, almost styrofoam pieces on the inside of these bladders and use this pump to evacuate the air and it actually creates a rigid moldable to the shape of whatever you're trying to immobilize splint and then you just put tape around it and it keeps it all in place very nicely and you can reuse these cardboard plastic splints they typically have a little foam insert and some holes along the side so you can put gauze in between there and tie it up here's a pelvic binder for pelvic fractures and here is a hair traction splint for mid shaft femur fractures so every time you're going to put a splint on a patient with one of these injuries, whether it be a fracture, strain, sprain, dislocation, we always want to check what's called PMS, pulse, motor, and sensation. Now I put assessment for long bone injuries up here because that's what our testable skill focuses on. It's long bone injuries, but we'll talk more about pulse motor sensation checks when we get to spinal immobilization in the next video. So for pulse, we're going to assess the pulse distal to the injury site, the radial pulse for the upper extremities and either a dorsal, pedal, or a posterior tibial pulse for the lower extremities. Now, we're not getting a rate. We're checking that for five to 10 seconds and we're making a determination, okay, it's present or it's not. Now for motor, 
for the upper extremities, you will evaluate motor function. If the patient can make a fist, undo the fist, spread their fingers, or make a hitchhiking sign with their thumb. So that tells us motor function is intact. For the lower extremities, we will have them tighten the kneecap and try to move the foot up and down like they're pressing on a gas pedal. That's usually a good indication that they can uh, maintain their motor function in the lower extremities. Now, these, these movements, they might not have a lot of strength, but what do we care about? We care about, are they able to move? And sensation, so PMS, last one here, sensation is intact. If the patient can tell you without looking, sometimes you might have to tell them to close their eyes, which finger or toe you're touching and can they feel painful stimuli? So if you pinch the back of their hand while they're not looking, can they feel that? Now let's talk about some general rules of splinting here. I'll just read through them. Before and after you apply the splint, assess PMS. We just talked about that. But here's the key information, before and after, because sometimes you manipulate that a little bit and it affects the PMS, so you have to check it after. Immobilize the joint slash bones above and below the injury site. So if you have a, a forearm fracture, you immobilize the wrist and the elbow. That's the joint below and above the long bone. If you have an injured joint, say somebody dislocates their elbow, you will immobilize the ulna and the radius, that lower arm, and you'll immobilize the humerus, the bone above it. So hopefully that makes sense. You're going to either immobilize the joint above and below for a long bone, or you're going to immobilize the long bone above and below for a joint injury. Remove or cut away clothing around the injured site with trauma shears. Remove all jewelry around that site. You wanna be very careful with swelling. You wanna make sure that um, when people have things like rings, bracelets on, that the swelling from the injury doesn't cause that to become a constrictive uh, device at that point and actually occlude blood flow. So you want to cover all wounds including open fractures with sterile dressings before applying a splint then gently bandage. And this is straight out of the protocol book, San Diego County Protocols for grossly angulated, that should say long bone fractures with neuro neurovascular compromise. These may be reduced with gentle unilateral traction for splinting per BHO. So that's base hospital order we can reduce these fractures. But again, that is on base hospital order only. Another San Diego County protocol, you can splint neurologically stable fractures as they lie. So as long as PMS is intact, even if it's angulated, if they're neurologically stable, you do not have to apply traction. They actually don't even want you to apply traction. Now you're going to pad the voids of each splint to prevent pressure and discomfort to the patient. You also want to apply the splint before trying to move the patient. If they're showing signs of shock, um, align the patient's supine, treat for shock, and transport immediately without taking time to apply a splint. Sometimes it is simply not a priority to get a splint on some patients. Sometimes there's so many other problems wrong with them. When we're talking about multi-system traumas or heavy amounts of bleeding, we do not want to waste time on scene applying splints. And in some cases, especially if you're close to receiving trauma center, you will not be applying a splint at all. You just don't have time. Now, emergency medical care, let's talk about this for some minute here. Take the necessary spine motion restriction precautions if a spinal injury is indicated or suspected. So if you're dealing with musculoskeletal trauma, you got to at least consider spinal motion restriction. And if you can't rule it out, you have to take spinal motion restriction precautions. Number two, assess and maintain adequate oxygenation to maintain an SpO2 sat of greater than or equal to 94% if multiple organ trauma or major bleeding O2 via non rebreather mask at 15 liters per minute. If no multiple organ trauma or major bleeding and the SpO2 sat is 94% or greater without signs of hypoxia, hypoxemia, or poor perfusion, you do not need to provide supplemental oxygen. So that's kind of a lot, but if you read through it, it makes sense. If they're bleeding or they have a suspected multi trauma incident, 
you want them on oxygen. What's the flow rate? What's the delivery device? It's 15 liters a minute, non breather mass. If they have an isolated extremity fracture and they have a good O2 set, they don't have any, any trouble breathing and they don't have any major bleeding, we won't give them oxygen. Splint bone slash joint injuries, check patient's distal pulses, motor function, and sensation both before and after splinting. Document your findings in the PCR. So that's patient care report. Apply cold packs to suspected fractures or dislocations to reduce pain and swelling. Elevate the extremity if possible. Keep it elevated through the transport. Reassess the patient's vital signs and interventions. Make sure the distal pulses, motor function, and sensation have improved or have not deteriorated because of the immobilization. So that's our little intro here to musculoskeletal trauma. Let's take a closer look at the actual skill. So besides these skills that we're going to talk about, uh, we do have videos on these skills. There's also some other videos on YouTube that you can find. Just type in long bone immobilization, national registry, EMT. But we are going to discuss... Let's do long bone immobilization first. For these skills, you will be using a SAM splint. So a SAM splint is that one we had pictured up there earlier. It's a little aluminum sheet surrounded by foam. They're extremely useful. Basically every agency carries these from mountain rescue to the fire department, to the ambulance, to the forest service. This is kind of across the board. Everybody's got these because they're really great. So just some basics, you size and mold the splint to the proper shape. This is a sugar tong splint. Uh, this is for a forearm fracture or suspected forearm fracture. You're going to apply the splint to the patient's arm. You wanna measure it on the side that's not affected and see how their hand is actually in a position of comfort. See how this folds down here and they can actually just, the patient can actually just grab it. And then you're going to wrap the splint with a bandage. Once it's wrapped with a bandage, sling and swath. So you take two triangular bandages. One of them goes like this. You put the affected arm. So let's say that this is the splinted extremity right here. And you put this corner of the triangular bandage against the far shoulder. And then you lift this one up to the near shoulder. You tie it off center so that they're not lying back on the gurney or right on the knot and then you put a little safety pin or you can even put a little knot on the end of this triangular bandage to create a holder for their elbow and then you take another triangular bandage and you put it around as a swath. So just verbalizing through the skill here, standard precautions, scene safety, I'm going to have a partner hold and maintain manual stabilization of the injury while I check distal PMS. So I'm going to check for a radial pulse. I'm going to make sure that they can feel light touch and pain. And I'm going to make sure that their motor function is intact. So the examiner will state pulse motor and sensory function are present and normal. So we're going to measure the splint. We'll extend out the SAM splint and we'll measure it. And when you measure it, that's kind of when you figure out, okay, here's where I need to fold it. When you apply it, that's where, okay, this is where the elbow is going to go. And we're going to be Prior to applying it, you want to form it a little bit. You see how it has this C shape? That gives it a lot more strength. And then you immobilize the joint above the injury site. So in this case, that would be the elbow. Immobilize the joint below the injury site. In this case, that would be the wrist. Secures the entire injured extremity. So that would be the bandage up here. And then you immobilize their hand or foot in the position of function. So the way it is immobilized here is actually in a position of function. And then we're going to, it's not really written in here, but it's, it's a component of securing the injured extremity and the immobilization of the hand or the foot. Right in there, you're going to apply the sling and swath. And then you're going to reassess pulse motor and sensory function. So that's a verbal run through of the skill. You guys, we talked a little bit about the different components. Uh, there's a video on it as well. I'm going to link with this one here in the canvas shell. So let's talk about joint immobilization. 
So with joint immobilization, this is an elbow dislocation. So as you can see, they immobilize the long bone above and the long bone below. And this is just walking you through the different uh, steps that it takes to make the splint. So they come in a roll, you unroll it using the non-affected arm, you size from the armpit to the knuckles, you fold over any portion that extends beyond the knuckles, form that C curve to give it rigidity. Using your own or the patient's unaffected arm, mold the splint and then make any additional changes to the shape of the splint. Sometimes you wanna make it a little stronger and then you apply the splint to the affected arm and you bandage the splint distal to proximal. Now, we'll verbally run through joint immobilization, standard precautions, scene safety. I'm going to have a partner hold and maintain manual stabilization of the injury while I assess distal motor sensory and circulatory functions of the injured extremity. So evaluate radial pulse. I'm going to evaluate light touch and pain response as well as um, motor function. So the examiner acknowledges motor, sensory, and circulatory functions are present and normal. So we will select the proper splinting material, in this case, a SAM splint. We will immobilize the site of the injury. So in this case, it's the elbow. So we're going to immobilize it. And then we are going to immobilize the bone above and below. So as we do here, the bone above would be the humerus, the bones below would be the ulna and the radius. And then we will secure the entire injured extremity. So bandage like so. And obviously you wouldn't leave their arm 90 degrees going off their body like this. You would simply have them lay it down by their side and take a triangular bandage and swath the completed splint to their body. We will then reassess distal motor sensory and circulatory functions in the injured extremity. Examiner acknowledges motor, sensory, and circular functions are present and normal. So again, take a look at those videos. I hope this is clear to you guys. If you have any questions, feel free to message me here on Canvas or leave a comment down below. And hopefully I will see you guys very soon. All right, have a good day.